Hello and welcome to the Top Story, a podcast with the headlines of the day from our correspondents around the world. I'm Tianlu. Coming up in this edition, fears of a wider regional conflict in the Middle East are at a tipping point after the assassination of Haniye. In New Zealand, more than 30 hours of continuous snowfall have swept across the South Island. And in southern India, rain-triggered landslides have killed at least 270 people. We、begin in the Middle East. Fears of a wider regional conflict are at a tipping point after the assassination. The killing happened just hours after Israel attacked the Lebanese capital, killing Hezbollah senior commander Fuad Shuka. Hamas says Haniyeh's deaths will take the battle to new dimensions and have major repercussions. Iran has declared three days of national mourning and vowed to retaliate. Israel says it's prepared for all scenarios, though it did not immediately own the attack. Meantime, the U.S. says it will help defend Israel if it's attacked. Esen Kivani has more from Tehran. Early Wednesday morning, the residence of Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran was struck, resulting in the death of one of Hamas's highest-ranking officials and a bodyguard. The Islamic Revolution Guards Corps says Haniyeh was killed by a projectile that struck the building. At the times when international efforts towards a new era of Palestinian unity are more concentrated than ever, assassination of the Hamas chief inside Tehran could seriously fuel the tensions. This could also be interpreted as another message from Israel after direct missile clashes between Tehran and Tel Aviv in April this year. Iran's high-ranking officials immediately reacted to the assassination on Wednesday. The supreme leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, issued a statement warning the move by Israel paves the way for harsh punishment. He said Iran considers revenge an obligation after Israel killed one of its esteemed guests. In his first official reaction as Iranian president, Masoud Pazhashkian warned Iran will make Israel regret its actions, calling it a cowardly act of terror. Pazhashkian vowed Iran will do all it can to defend its territorial integrity. Following the intensifying exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah in the last week of July, regional tensions seem to be at their highest point since the outbreak of war in Gaza last year. All eyes are now on Tehran's expected reaction, along with resistant groups across the region. That was Essen Kivani reporting. Meantime, the United Nations Secretary General believes that the latest tensions in the Middle East could cause a dangerous escalation at a moment when all efforts should instead be leading to a ceasefire in Gaza. Jody Jacobs reports from the United Nations. Fears are mounting here at the United Nations of a full-blown regional war in the Middle East, following the killing of Ismail Haniyeh in Iran on Wednesday. In a letter to the UN Security Council, Iran says it will not hesitate to exercise its inherent right to self-defense, and thus has the UN Secretary General concerned. The Secretary General has consistently called for maximum restraint by all. Antonio Guterres, who is currently on vacation, is said to have had several phone calls during the course of Wednesday in an attempt to bring calm to the situation. Through his spokesperson, Guterres says that the international community must work together to urgently prevent any actions that could push the entire Middle East over the edge. How many more civilians are going to be killed, right, or injured, or, or wounded? How much, you know, how much longer、uh, will the the thousands and thousands of people who've been, have had to move from、uh, South Lebanon to seek? Safety and those、uh, on the Israeli end、uh, who've had on the Israeli side of the blue line who've had to seek safety in in the center. How long does that have to go on? Meanwhile, the UN Security Council meeting has been called for by China, Algeria, Russia, and Iran. Countries with major influence must put more pressure and work more vigorously on the parties concerned, and make tangible, good faith efforts to put out the flames of war in Gaza. The United States was not aware of. Or involved in the apparent death of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh. Indeed, we have no independent confirmation as to Hamas's claims regarding his death. In its letter to the Security Council, President Iran's permanent representative 
called for decisive action from the international community and for the council to punish the perpetrators, saying this was a clear violation of international law. Now it's Jody Jacobs reporting. Turn to Oceania. New Zealand is breathing a sigh of relief after a major snowstorm swept across the South Island but failed to cause any major damage or disruption. Local weather authorities had predicted more than 30 hours of continuous snowfall. Some high country regions received more than half a metre of snow in just 24 hours, which closed some major roads. Luckily, there have been no report of any livestock losses, as many had feared. Own Poland reports. It's a winter wonderland, with up to half a metre of snow blanketing many parts of New Zealand's South Island after one of the longest and most intense snowstorms in many years. For many visiting tourists, it was mostly a lot of fun, but one group of Korean cycling enthusiasts got caught out by the weather when they tried to ride through a mountain pass. The cyclists have been on a tour of New Zealand and were lucky to escape from the freezing conditions without suffering from hypothermia. The team went up to, up to the peak and they got stranded obviously because it's so icy and they yeah, basically had to be rescued. However, the main concern came from farmers who have just suffered a dry autumn with little grass growth and the last thing they wanted was snow. Many of New Zealand's 25 million sheep can be found around here in the Canterbury Hills and because it's close to the spring lambing season there's a huge concern about the welfare of pregnant ewes in particular. Fortunately there was sufficient warning of the icy blast for farmers to move stock to lower ground for protection although some sheep didn't seem to mind foraging in the snow. Even the cattle seemed to make the most of the conditions. The biggest problem was on the roads, and most major highways across mountain passes were closed for many hours because road crews couldn't keep up with the sheer volume of white stuff that kept falling. We've got uh, graders and, and all sorts of equipment that's been working to, to keep it open, um, but when, when it's falling at a rate that we can't clear it fast enough, the road has to be closed. Luckily for everyone, the worst snowstorm in many years was less intense than originally forecast and the memories will mostly be those of the tourists who got to enjoy the South Island at its wintry best. That was Own Poland on the heavy snow in New Zealand. On Paris Olympics, the triathletes have finally dived into the Seine after an official notice informed that its waters were finally safe. The race was originally scheduled for Tuesday, but it was postponed due to poor water quality in the river. John Bever has more. After more than a billion dollars of investment and years of work, the triathlons did take place on Wednesday in Paris. They left it very late though. It was 3 a.m. local time on Wednesday that a decision was finally made uh, that the pollution levels in the river were low enough uh, for the swimming to go ahead. And just five hours later, the women's triathlon started, followed by the men's triathlon that had been delayed by 24 hours uh, when the water quality wasn't good enough on Tuesday. There are already people calling uh, on this to just be the start of the cleanup of the river here in the French capital. Some saying that more investment is needed to try and improve water quality here, to return the Seine to a level where people can swim on a more regular basis. But for the Olympic organizers themselves, uh, this was something that they had aimed for. It would have been deeply embarrassing for the French authorities if they'd not managed to have uh, the swimming take place in the triathlon. At one stage, they'd threatened to lower the triathlon to a duathlon, get rid of the swimming altogether and just have the cycling and the running. In the end, that wasn't necessary as the checks for bacteria revealed it was safe enough to swim. They were looking at things like E. coli and other harmful bacteria emitted from the sewers here, especially when it rains, which it has done uh, on and off over the last few days. So Olympic organisers very relieved that the triathlon could take place here in Paris and for the thousands that turned out to watch, they were rewarded uh, with a gold for France in the women's event and a bronze for France in the men's. So certainly delighted that the triathlon could take place. Now was John Bever reporting from Paris. In Asia, 
rain-triggered landslides have killed at least 270 people in southern India. Rescue workers are searching under collapsed roofs and debris of flattened homes for possible survivors in Kerala. Authorities say casualty numbers may continue to rise in the coming days. Rahika Bajaj reports from the scene. I'm in the village of Churilmala that has been hard hit by the multiple landslides that took place in the early hours of Tuesday. Rescue work going on in full swing and the big boulders, uh, that was actually uh, a school playground. And those boulders have actually travelled about two to three kilometres downstream because that's where the first landslide took place in a small village uh, where... A lot of damage has been seen as well. The army trying to reconstruct a key bridge and uh, a road that has been completely washed away. This was an important bridge that connected two of the key villages in this area. Uh, the village temple under that giant tree uh, that was prayed to every single day has also been washed away, as have uh, the multiple houses that used to once exist in this area. <laughs> We heard loud noises and then people screaming. We saw the boulders and mud coming from the top from the village above. Houses just disappeared. The entire town was full of water. Some of us were climbing trees and buildings, but many got stuck. The main problem is transport because we can't send relief to the other side after the bridge collapsed. The army is working on it and we are using all kinds of equipment to help them. Things will improve once the bridge is ready, even if temporary. The priority of the army, of course, is to evacuate those who may be isolated in areas that have been cut off, but they're also working towards restoring connectivity between the two villages by building a brand new bridge, the material for which was delayed simply because uh, the weather conditions did not allow for the trucks to come in these tiny hilly roads. Uh, locals are telling me that uh, some of this material started coming in uh, in the early hours, and the army is now focusing and trying to ensure that the bridge is made as early uh, as is possible and even as that is happening we are seeing bodies being uh, pulled out uh, right now at the moment uh, the chances of any survivors uh, would be a miracle but as far as the rescue work goes uh, the weather not making it any easier now it's Rahika Bajaj reporting In China, the central Hunan province is recovering from heavy rainstorms in the aftermath of Typhoon Gaimi. The route to Bamianshan Yao ethnic township in Zixin has reopened after a huge landslide cut off access. It is the only road connecting villages in the mountainous area with the outside world. The rainstorms have displaced more than 16,000 people. Rescue operations are underway. Zhu Luoman has details. Where over 16,000 people have been evacuated, Evacuated. Local authorities say that four people have been killed and three are still missing. They also said they have already rescued over 5,000 people. Rescue operations continues. Uh, four helicopters have been dispatched, one in charge of fixing the power outage and the other three in charge of dropping off necessities and supplies, including food, water, medicine and power banks. The transport into this mountain villages have been cut off but was resumed earlier Wednesday morning. Power and telecom emergency services have also arrived, but the capacity is still very limited. The landslide comes from very intense rainfall in the past few days, brought about by Typhoon Gaimi, which has been wreaking havoc here in eastern China's provinces. Uh, The rainfall has also sent water levels at the local reservoir, reaching its capacity. The Dongjiang Reservoir is one of the biggest here in southern China uh, and is to the upstream of the Pearl River. So far, over 100,000 people have been affected. That was Chulo Man reporting. Now recapping today's headlines. Fears of a wider regional conflict in the Middle East are at a tipping point after the assassination of Haniye. In New Zealand, more than 30 hours of continuous snowfall have swept across the South Island. And in southern India, rain-triggered landslides have killed at least 270 people. That's it for this edition of The Top Story, a podcast that brings you world headlines every weekday. For more news in politics, business, sports and culture, you can subscribe to The Beijing Hour, a one-hour podcast news magazine program. We welcome and appreciate all ratings and reviews. I'm Tianlu. Thank you for listening.